This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have the man, the myth, the legend, Mike Peters of The Alarm. How you doing today, Mike? Excellent, Eric. Thank you. Loving being in California. You really do like it here. It's nice. It's great. Costa Mesa, being by the beach in Newport, Huntington. It's fantastic. So what are your fondest memories of growing up in the seaside town of Pristatin? Yeah, real and Pristatin. My fondest memories of growing up, it was a seaside town. It was a bit, a bit like the British version of Asbury Park in New Jersey, and the it was a seasonal place so as a kid growing up there was all kinds of people come in from big cities mods and rockers and skinheads and greasers and and they'd all interact in the fairgrounds and there was great music and great i grew up in the glam rock era so all, all the bands like sweet and mud and slade were playing and, and i got exposed to all that and it was a fantastic time to grow up so is it true that you grew up living in the crescent hotel in edward henry street real with former alarm member eddie mcdonald and how did that shape you as a person yeah, Eddie lived uh, on Edward Henry Street, one house away from me, and I was brought up in the Crescent Hotel with my parents. When we were kids, Eddie was a year younger than me, but that was a lot when you're a small kid. So he he was slightly more friends with my brother. I had a dog called Lobo, who was a, a German shepherd. Eddie used to tease the dog under the gate in the back of the, the pub. My dog did not like Eddie <laughs> and used to chase him around whenever she was off the lead. She'd bang, she'd be after him. Later on in life, I started a punk band called The Toilets, and, yeah. and Eddie used to come to the gigs and he'd learn to play the guitar and we were both into the the songwriters of bands i was into glenn matlock of the sex pistols because he wrote the songs or we were into mid jaw because he wrote he wrote the songs and we thought maybe if we collaborate we could write some good songs together so that's the start of that musical friendship it's unique to to actually say you've grown up in a hotel so what are the circumstances that led to you growing up in a hotel yeah well my granddad he owned and ran hotels and bars and then it became came part of the family business and my dad was from London originally and, and his house was bombed in the Second World War so he was evacuated to the calmer place of North Wales and met my mum and settled down there and um, I still live in the village where my mum and dad had their first pub it's called the Badinig in Dizzeth and I still live there now so the, the apple's not fallen too far from the tree but it was a great place to grow up because you, my dad was and my mum were both really great at dealing with all people from all walks of life so we had we had a lounge bar where maybe the the owners of the fairground and the garages and the shops would would drink in their suits and their, their with their wives all dressed up and then across the hallway there'd be the public bar where all the mechanics and the fairground workers and the people who worked for the people next door my granddad and my dad and my mum had a great way of bringing everybody together and making them all feel special no matter whether they had anything or whether they they had everything so that was um a great level i could see my mum and dad were you know just didn't judge people whether they had money or not they just treated everybody the same and, and uh, i think that was a real good quality what was it about seeing the sex pistols live in 1976 that inspired you to form your first band the toilets well i saw johnny rotten as close as I'm sat to you and the eyes were blazing and, and when he sang I didn't know what anarchy meant and I tried to track him down at the bar and he told me to uh, F off in very uh, not so polite terms and, but I thought it was incredible because he meant it it was his way of waking a young guy like me up out of life and just showing him what the possibilities were and then not long after I, I went to see The Clash as well and saw Joe Strummer I actually went to the bathroom before the band came on and the whole of The Clash stood next to me in the bathroom and I was like wow I'm in The Clash here for a minute and I asked Joe Strummer what White Riot meant he said it's about the future so I had a negative response from Johnny Rotten and a positive one from, from Joe Strummer but they were like the, the, where the magnets started and the, and the forces ignited and I thought I've got to start a band and that was it we, the toilets were born What was your relationship like with future Waterboys keyboardist and World Party frontman Carl Wallinger while you were in the band Quasimodo I wasn't actually in the band I was a fan of the band Quasimodo oh and and that I'd, this is before the Sex Pistols incidents I was a big David Bowie fan as I said earlier I was into the glam rock thing and through David Bowie I learned about the Stooges and Velvet Underground and the New York Dolls and there was a band called Quasimodo that had eventual alarm members Dave Sharp and Nigel Twist in the band wow. and I used to idolise them and sit outside the rehearsal room and, uh, and Carl Bollinger was the keyboard player and, and one day they let me come into the room and I, I was trying to show them who Lou 
Reed was. And I said, he's got this great song called Vicious. And I could show you how to do it. The problem was I could only play two chords. I couldn't play the third. And they kind of threw me out of the room laughing. I was trying to say, but this is where the future's going to be. And, and eventually, um, Quasimodo... Um, they kind of disbanded because Carl went to London to um, further career out away from North Wales and the Nigel and Dave were forced to stay behind by their parents so it kind of put um, a, a, a divide amongst them and, and I thought wow he's gone to London we'll never see him again <laughs> you know he'd disappear and it was in in 1984 and we were playing in uh, Copenhagen with the Pretenders and the bill was Pretenders, The Alarm and The Water Boys. What a great show. Oh, yeah. and, and we were sound checking and The Water Boys walked in and, and I could see, I looked and that was Carl Wallinger and yeah. Dave and Nige, they yeah. just nearly fainted on the spot because they hadn't seen him since he'd walked out of Prostatin. So it was, uh, and then he's gone on to do great things yeah. and uh, it's, it's really nice that he's gone on to achieve his, his dreams and his ambitions. For us, like Nigel, who was a drummer, was a massive Carl Wallinger fan. And every time I'd bring a song into reels like 68 Guns, he'd go, it's not quite as good as Carl Wallinger is. <laughs> I think it's bloody hell. <laughs> and so he'd always do, uh, you know, put, bring us down to earth like that. But but uh, yeah, Carl was a great writer, still is, and uh, he's a great artist. And, you know, I learned a lot from him. I, you know, I sometimes think, would we have gone to London in 1981 as the alarm to make it if we hadn't known of, if I hadn't in the back of my mind had that example and Carl Wallinger went in, you know, and this was 1976, maybe, seven, when he went before, it was before I'd seen the Sex Pistols and he, he left and I thought, he probably was 17 18 at the time but what a brave thing to do and eventually we did it a few years late five years later probably we, we actually went together as the alarm and I was probably inspired by Carl Wallinger in in you know think about it now in the in the back of my mind there was probably a, a relation there between the two um, examples of trying to make it in life how did your power pop mod band 17 evolve into what was to become the alarm with members Eddie McDonald bass Dave Sharp guitars and Nigel Twist drum the Toilets was my first band and then the first member to join was Nigel became the drummer the Alarms drummer joined because our original drummer was a guy called Dave England but he didn't like punk really so he lasted about four rehearsals and then and then we were was, we needed to get a drummer and a bass player for the Toilets was a guy called Glyn Crossley and he'd been in Quasimodo he was the bass player and he said well I'll get Nigel to be the drummer and Nigel came along and he didn't like punk either so I had to persuade him to do it and uh, and make sure he, he dressed in the right clothes and everything because he was still a bit of a hippie really and uh, we had a great singer from Ireland called uh, O'Malley his name was Richard Jones his name was but O'Malley he was an incredible front man and we, one day I, I got us a gig in Liverpool playing an audition with a band called Shattered Doll it was at a club called Eric's in Liverpool which is opposite the Cavern Club where the Beatles had come from we played our set and as soon as I put my guitar down Bob Geldof from the Boontown Raps jumped on stage and Roger Eagle who ran the club who was a big Northern Soul DJ he came up and went that was incredible do you want to play with The Clash tonight it was like what you know it, could, it was that quick and a few hours later we were smashing it out with The Clash and we were a good band the Toys were an incredible band but we what we lacked was was a Sven Garley behind a, yeah. a brain behind us, someone who, who could channel our teenage energy into something tangible. And and we, you know, it's like the Clash had had Bernie Rhodes, and he said, "Look, don't write. I, you know, I'm so bored with you. Make it. I'm bored with the USA. Give it an edge." Malcolm McLaren had managed the New York Dolls, and he gave the Pistols their edge at the beginning, and we didn't have that. So we just had to learn as we went along and uh, eventually it kind of burnt out really before we could realise the potential we actually really had in the band. Eddie McDonald started coming to see all the Toilets gigs. We got chatting about collaborating on songs and broadening their musical horizon and then we decided that if he was going to join the band we'll change the name and 17 was the title of a song on the Sex Pistols debut album and we became more melodic. You know, I was very into the idea of being the songwriter. My first album I bought was Slayed Alive and they had songs on like born to be wild and brackets it said steppenwolf and i thought 
Oh, I don't want an album with them on it. I just only want the ones that said in brackets Slade. And it was only when I got home and realised that these were actually cover versions and uh, and that the, 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 it was Slade. And, but I thought, I want to be one of those guys. My ambition as a musician wasn't to be on the stage as a guitarist or anything like that. I wanted to be the songwriter and have my name in the brackets after the song title. Sometimes things are just meant to be. It just seems like the man upstairs had his hand on your life. Maybe, you yeah. know, big Absolutely, time. yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I often think you know, where the songs come from, you know, and I, I often tell a story, we did a tour with Bob Dylan in 1988. I was stood right behind Bob Dylan going through the immigration into Canada. You know, and we were at a border crossing that's frontier land, wasn't it? All that kind of stuff. And next minute a melody appears in my head and it's, there are no frontiers, we, no border lines, we can't cross tonight. And it became a song called No Frontiers on the 1989 Alarm Change album. But I often think it was, you know, the big man upstairs sending some music down to planet Earth and he, on this occasion he missed Bob Dylan and got me instead <laughs> so it became an alarm song since you brought up Bob tell me a little bit about his personality he's very private he agreed to having the alarm on the tour because he he liked the fact that we were from Wales and he was into Dylan Thomas and all the poetry that had come out of Wales and and um, he was uh, on the occasions we did talk he was he was fascinated by that he liked if he was coming into the gig while we were on stage, he, he liked to come up on the stage and hear us play the Bells of Rumney that the birds had famously covered. But we sang the whole song with all the words from Idris Davis, who'd written the, the words, who's a Welsh poet. He liked that. And he liked staying in hotels that didn't have air conditioning. So we stayed in a lot of kind of Motel 6 kind of places wow. that had swimming pools so he could swim outdoors. He was a very bright, intelligent guy. And that was about as far as it went. And he invited me up on stage to sing with him a couple of times. And... Uh, and and I think he kind of tests you out when he gets you on the stage. The first time he, he said, come and play Knocking on Heaven's Door. And and G. Smith, the guitarist from Saturday Night Live, was playing guitar in the band at the time. He said, look, there'll be no introduction. He'll start playing Knocking on Heaven's Door. And that's your cue to walk on. And, and if he wants you to sing, he'll call you up to the microphone and say, OK, great. So I get up there and I'm playing the next minute. Bob looks over and gives me the nod and I'm on the mic singing like this with Bob Dylan. It was amazing. And the second night, which it was down here in, in, um, in California, it was in Santa Barbara and, uh, and near San Diego. And, uh, and we, the second night I get up on the stage, he's playing the song in D minor and he's doing it in three time in waltz time and it's like mom I take this badge off of me I'm going oh, I didn't even know what it was till I heard the first line and I come out on the stage and then you know we get singing it again and, and it's like a completely different song and I think it's his way of seeing can you go with the flow or have you got what it takes to go where no man has gone before and and that's what I still admire about him now I went my friend who was i grew up with who was best man for jules and i our wedding still works for bob dylan to this day and uh not so long ago in i think it was 2013 bob dylan played at the royal albert hall and it had he hadn't played there since the 60s and it was a momentous occasion and we went down and, and we, we were lucky we got to go on the stage because red's our production manager for bob dylan and and uh, and i remember sitting in the audience and, and he was playing a song i thought what's this and he was i realized when i heard some of the lyrics it was tangled up in blue but i did not recognize it and i, I thought wow if bob dylan at his age is still challenge himself and his audience and we have to we can do that as well as the alarm and so i went back and you know i thought it was coming up for 30 years of the alarms declaration and you know reworked it to suit the times and it, it was quite revelatory and that, so i'm still learning from bob dylan to this this very day because it by his actions he, he shows you how to be an artist that, that can survive the test of time the blaring out show